3, uh, verses 1 to 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Thank you, Vaughan. Uh, we've heard from God's word. We're going to hear it expounded. But before we do, we seek God's blessing so that uh, he'll give us a mind of Christ that we might be able to understand his word. And, but more than that, uh, that we might be those who hear it, believe it, and then live it out. So let's, um, let's pray and we'll seek the Lord's blessing upon us. Father, we, we believe that your word is truth. Scripture says it claims for itself that it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It's described in the Old Testament as a hammer that shatters rocks. Indeed, uh, your churches are commended in Thessalonica because they receive the word of God as it really is, not the words of men, but the very words of God. But we pray as we meditate on 1 Timothy 3, as it instructs us around qualifications of elders, that, Lord, that that will shape our thinking about leadership. And it might shape the way we pray for our leaders, or the way we submit to our leaders, and certainly the way that we elect our leaders. To this end, we commend ourselves and the preaching of the word to you, that Jesus Christ might be exalted and his church might be built up. In his name we pray. Amen. So last week, I introduced you to my, um, my new car project, the 1964 Land Rover. You're going to be hearing lots about this. Now, you don't know this, but the blokes have got a bit of a, a, an online chat thing, and, and everybody has been slagging off my Land Rover. Uh, some have been suggesting it's a waste of money. Well, I'm figuring already, this is two sermon illustrations I've got out of it. Already. I reckon it'll be heaps more as things unfold. So it's going to be valuable, but you just have to bear with me. If you're not interested in cars... Um, just, you'll see the, the value of this. So, about to purchase a Land Rover, 1964. So, what's that? So, it's 50-odd it's, it's, it's years old. And, and so, if you're going to buy a car that's edging towards 60, you need to think about what you're looking for in a car. And so, I did a bit of research on what are the likely problems, what are the dangers when you're buying a Land Rover, the sort of issues that are, in a sense, deal-breakers that would make a purchase an unviable project. Sort of things that, 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 that you know, are terminal as opposed to the stuff which are inconvenient but, but fixable. Now, when I did my research, the potential deal breakers when you buy a, a 1960 Land Rover is things like rust in the chassis or rust in the, in the bulkhead. And... and so when you look at the car, that's what you want to look for because if it's got serious rust in the chassis or the bulkhead, basically you're just throwing money in a hole. It's a deal breaker. But, but, but while you're looking at that stuff, there's lots of other stuff you'll see, but stuff that's not important. Like in my car, I purchased, has no clutch, uh, has no brakes, uh, got massive rust holes, sort of like Freddie Flintstone in the floor. You go yabba-dabba with your feet through. It doesn't have a roof, no indicators, seats, seat belts, windows. Well, for that matter, it doesn't even have a straight panel on it. But the thing is, those things are fixable. They're not important, so I don't get distracted by that. I work out what's important, what are the deal breakers, and I focus on that. And as it is when you purchase a 60-year-old car, so it is 
with eldership. And lastly, um, we saw how elders function. Remember, we likened them to rubbish bins. Uh, this week, when we think about the qualifications of eldership, we're going to liken them to purchasing a Land Rover. That is, you need to know what's important to look for. You, you need to know when you're choosing elders, what are the deal breakers? Not, not the stuff that's unimportant. We're not going to get distracted by that. But what are the stuff which is a deal breaker? Now, before I unpack that from 1 Timothy 3, I just know that there will be some young people or others who are thinking, why do I care? I'm not going to be an elder, or I don't even get to vote for the eldership. Why should I care? And I want to put it to you, whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, in fact, whether you care or not, the eldership, uh, their fidelity and fruitfulness, their leadership and godliness, it actually it largely shapes your experience at church. It, it shapes what sort of church family that you'll reside in, uh, what sort of covenant community that you're going to be in, and, and what you hope if you've got good and godly elders, good protectors and feeders of the flock, is that you will be in a church that by God's grace will be shaped by the gospel, it will be powered by God's spirit, and these elders will model for you the way of the gospel. And, and by God's grace, what it will do is your own hearts will end up being recalibrated. That is, changed so that your focus becomes more God-like, more Christ-like, more kingdom-focused. Because what elders do is they teach, they feed, and they equip us to live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we should love him and serve him and witness to him as we ought to do, as our only reasonable response to the gospel. And so in that sense, it's a vital sermon for all of us because the Christian experience is largely tethered, that is joined to the men who are called to protect and lead you. So let's turn to the text. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 uh, Paul starts off by saying, this is trustworthy, this saying. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So, but he starts off by saying that, that the role of an elder is actually a noble role. It's a noble task. It's an it's a honorable, if you like, or virtuous calling. Now, I admit, in, in today's culture, being a church leader probably isn't particularly virtuous, isn't particularly high. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm an elder. It's not quite the same punch in our culture, but in God's eyes, it's actually a noble task. That's why you read in 1 Thessalonians 5.12, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, because they're protectors of the covenant community, because they are your leaders and shepherds, because of their work, you ought to esteem them highly in love. Because if they do, their, if they fulfill their calling well, then the church will go gangbusters and it will be a fruitful, flourishing covenant community. It's why in the book of Hebrews we read, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account. Let them do this, that is the watching over your soul, with joy and not with groaning. For that would be a no advantage to you. In other words, don't make their lives hard or difficult because you actually want them to go well because when it goes well with them, it'll go well with the church. Because your Christian experience is largely tethered to a healthy eldership. And where you have an unhealthy eldership, you'll have an unhealthy church. And so Paul starts off saying, listen, this is a trustworthy saying, that the, the, the call to eldership, that is worthy of respect. It is a noble task. But also notice what he says there. He, he says that the man who desires it, who aspires to it, 
to this noble task. And there's, there's this, the starting point is an assumption that an elder feels a sense of call to love not only Christ, but his church. That, the, that he has this, if you like, uh, desire or aspiration to be a shepherd of the sheep. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 2, elders ought to tend the flock of Christ willingly, eagerly, not under compulsion. This is not, this is not duty, this is calling. And if, if a man doesn't feel called to shepherd Christ's flock and to love them and to teach them and to pray for them, then that's a deal breaker. If he's elbowed into the role by his wife or cajoled by other members of the congregation, it's a deal breaker. You've got to do it willingly, eagerly, not under compulsion. It's a noble task, but it must be desired. It must be aspired to. And do you know why that calling is so important? Because actually leading is hard. Any sort of leadership. Ask Dan Andrews, ask ScoMo, ask anyone who leads in an occupation at work. And, and particularly as we have leaders in the church, that's only going to get harder as culture changes. And so that sense of call, that, that, that sense of desire, at times will be the only thing that keeps the older going. The desire to protect and shepherd and feed the flock, especially when it's costly or when he's critiqued or when it just feels overwhelming. And so a man must desire that noble task. And if he doesn't, he's not called and it is a deal breaker. In Land Rover talk, this is rust in the chassis stuff and it's terminal. Because if you get men who are not called into ministry, you know what they end up as? They end up as those empty rubbish bins that get blown over in a storm. So the two things we know from the first verse is eldership is a noble task. It's an honorable task. It's a virtuous one. But a man must aspire to it. He must feel a sense of call. God must be working in his heart to say, love, feed, protect my sheep. In that sense, it's not a duty, it's a calling. So then, having laid that out, he then says, well, then what should we look for? What, what would an elder look like? Not what would we like him to look like, because if, if you don't choose them on what you would prefer, because some would prefer him to have certain politics or a certain type of personality. Some might prefer their elders to be successful or a rude or articulate, or have no tattoos. But none of those things are deal breakers. None of those things are listed by Paul that disqualify a man from eldership. But he does list deal breakers in verses 2 and 3. He says, this is what an elder must be. Therefore, an overseer, and remember we have looked at that last week, uh, an overseer, the, the Greek word is episkopos, so we might get bishop from, and elder is presbyteros. It's the same word, the synonyms, they're interchangeable. And so an overseer is an elder, an elder is an overseer. Overseer is more about the function. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. What would it look like to be above reproach? And then he tells you, the husband of one wife. Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And so he's, uh, he's unpacking what it looks like to be above reproach. Uh, the word there means above censure or critique. He's above criticism. So what would it look like for that man, ethically, to be above reproach? Well, he would be the husband of one wife. And in the Greek, literally what it says is he is a one-woman man. That's what it means. The absence of the definite article stresses character, not his marital status. In other words, he's known to be a one-man woman. You can be married to one woman, but not be a one-man woman. The text isn't arguing that you just have one wife. Because it's true in those days, 
many, often people have many wives. It's not talking about divorce and remarriage. It's very clear in the Greek. It says that he must be a one-man woman. Oh, sorry, one-woman man. I wondered why they're all smiling. And I'm thinking, why are they all smiling? Oh. He needs to really be a one-woman man. Okay. If I was preaching in the United Church, no one would have even laughed. They would have gone, oh, yeah, but of course. She must be that. Um, so the elder's got to be known. What he's trying to stress here is fidelity, faithfulness. It, you want to look to a man who's committed to his wife, who loves her and adores her. That is, you, the scripture's talking about he casts his net no, no further than his own home. Or in the words of the Old Testament, he is satisfied with the breasts of his youth. And it's not that he's perfect or he's without fault. If, if the husband was perfect, he would be Christ. But he's above reproach in this matter. There's no cloud of doubt about his fidelity. And if there is, it's a deal breaker. He's also supposed to be sober-minded and self-controlled. And the idea is like temperate and controlled. He's, he's, he's got a proven track work here that he's able to curb desires and impulses. In other words, what he's saying is that the elder ought to be disciplined and reliable. He's not given to flights of fancy. You know. In other words, you could count on this bloke. His yes is a yes and his no is a no. Text said he's also respectable. That is the idea here is orderly, unlike my teenage daughter's room. He's worthy of respect, unlike my teenage daughter's room. You know, you sort of, I, I often mock boring people, particularly I've said before, accountants, people uh, like that with boring occupations, office workers, council workers, things. But the scripture actually, despite my often mockery of such people, it's actually saying, no, actually, they're reliable people. Now, chaotic people can be interesting. I admit that. Like at a party, a chaotic person can be uh, immensely amusing and engaging. Spontaneity certainly can be fun and can be good. But not necessarily great in leadership. If they're chaotic or too spontaneous. The idea is here that the elders are reliable and respectable. You can count on them. And then it keeps on unpacking what they're like. Not only are they reliable people, but they're also hospitable and able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And, you know, sometimes we often miss this one, but it's such an important one. Elders need to be hospitable. You can't be aloof and be a leader. You can't, be, you can't say, I'm going to be a shepherd, but I don't want to be around the flock. You need to not only open your hearts to God's people, you need to open up your homes. There's this idea of leadership, having hospitality, being hospitable. Because so often it's in the home and when people are relaxed that you can really disciple and encourage one another. And Paul lists a whole bunch of warnings that follow. He says, make sure he's not a drunkard, that he's not angry or violent, not, not a... Not a quarrelsome or materialistic bloke but rather it contrasts it says but rather he's someone who's strong but but gentle you know anyone who's strong and gentle in the bible it's possible to be both strong and gentle in fact someone who's strong and gentle is another if you like exhibition of their self-control and the elder needs to be self-controlled I, I i went to theological college with a Another bloke who was ordained, uh, he's about a year, year behind me. Um, but in his first eight years out of PTC, he pastored three different congregations. Three churches in eight years, and all of his ministries ended the same way, in conflict. Now, if you were looking for a pastor, he ticked most of the boxes. He was a decent preacher. He had very sound theology. In fact, he had excellent theology. He had a good family. But he was quarrelsome. 
It was quarrelsome. It always caused divisions. And according to Paul, that's actually a deal breaker. You don't want a leader who loves to quarrel, who likes to fight, because they'll just be divisive and they'll scatter the bride of Christ. Paul says, if you've got a man, I don't care how qualified he is, how gifted he is, how godly he seems in all these other areas, how successful he might seem in other spheres of life, if he is a quarrelsome, angry person, then that is a deal breaker and he should never, ever be considered for leadership. Because we want our men in eldership to be gentle with people. And of course, there's going to be times that elders have to rebuke when needed. That They need to speak tough love into certain circumstances when there's sin that needs to be challenged, that they're not aggressive and quarrelsome. And if they are, it's a deal breaker. And lastly, he says, he must be above reproach when it comes to his teaching. So all this is about being above reproach. He says, well, he must be able to teach. Remember, we saw it last week, that elders are protectors of the covenant community. And the way that they protect the covenant community is that they teach. And that's why the elder here has to be able to teach or apt to teach. Because his work is, at least a significant part of his work, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. See, the work of ministry is the churches. The elder's responsibility is to equip them for that work. To teach, encourage, model, disciple. And to that end, you must have an elder who's able to do that, who is able to teach. In other words, he must know the Bible. He must know what is truth and what is error. Otherwise, how can he lead and feed and protect the flock of Jesus Christ? You, you don't want a kind surgeon. You want an able surgeon. You don't want a cheery pilot. You want an able pilot. So it is with an elder. He must be able to teach because that's how he protects and feeds and provides for God's church. And more than that, we want our elders not just to be able to teach, but to be able to teach truth. And in our context, as we understand the Scripture, that means being reformed. We believe in the doctrines of grace. We proclaim the doctrines of grace. That, that we're saved not because of works, but because of grace. We're saved because God the Father showered His love upon us in God the Son and poured out His Spirit, God the Spirit, into our hearts that we might believe the gospel. And God did all that. And what did we contribute to that salvation? Nothing but sin. Even repentance and faith, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 8, is the gift of God. God gifts us a new heart, regeneration, and blesses us with faith that we might look, turn to Jesus, and trust in Him. We want our elders to know those truths, to love those truths, because that's what glorifies God. That's what builds up the church. That's why we ask our elders to subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Huge old document, I don't know. 1640 or something. Ages old. But you know what? It's one of the best summaries of the Bible's teaching that we have. And we ask all our elders, you need to believe those truths as a summary of Scripture and then you must be able to maintain it, assert it, and defend it. That's what we ask them to do. Because if an elder cannot contend for the faith that was once, and all, once for all delivered to the saints, it's actually a deal breaker. I don't care how nice he is. I don't care how popular he is. If he's not able to teach, he's not qualified to lead. We expect our elders to contend for the faith that was once for all given to the saints. In the text there, it's the definite article, the faith. Not a faith, not his faith, the faith. There is these defined truths called the faith doctrine and he's got to contend for it he's got to assert it he's got to maintain it he's got to defend it that's why an elder must be apt or able to teach imagine if um if we use my wife as an example imagine if you saw someone slander my wife 
what, what do you think that she would expect me to do? <clears throat> because I'm not a violent man, you can rule that as an option out. But what would she otherwise expect me to do? She would expect me to jump to her defence. She would expect me to contend for the truth. It, it would be insufficient for me to simply say, um, uh, those slanderous things you said are not true. That's not enough. She would want me to put those people right in their thinking. I would have to tell them the truth about my wife, of her fidelity, her gentleness, her kindness, yes, and her occasional snoring. But all of that is part of her unfading beauty. And in the same way, an elder is expected to defend Christ's bride. He doesn't just say this is not true, but he must be capable and able to say what is true. Because elders defend the bride of Jesus Christ. They must be able to teach so they can equip the saints for the work of ministry. And the reason why, if you if it crossed your mind, hey, I wonder why the Apostle Paul stuck able to teach right in the middle of a couple of verses all about character. What's that about? It was because in the Christian world, in the church, that the two are tethered together. In a sense, your teaching is effectively predicated on your character. Because no one goes to a dentist with rotten or yellow teeth. And people don't listen to elders who don't model what they teach. And so Paul says, you're able to teach, but it's wrapped up in this character that is above reproach. So, so now we, we know what the elder must look like, but how would you make that assessment? Where would I look to to sort of come to some conclusions on that? What spheres of life do I need to take into account when I make such judgment? Uh, in the past, we tend to look to the sphere of work or careers. So if someone was particularly successful in their career, we often rewarded them with leadership in the church. Uh, some, in some churches even today, people choose people based on their influence or their popularity. And yet what Paul does is he redirects our eyes from influence or, or career and he says, look to their home. Do you want to know what they're really like? Look to their home. It's the home where his qualifications are both forged and tested. And by the way, as an aside, a bit of a distraction, but as an aside, it does say something about church, doesn't it? Uh, don't miss that. The assumption underlying Scripture is that church is a covenant community that we actually engage with each other. Church is a covenant community where we actually know each other. Church is a covenant community where you might know what's going on in someone else's home. Church is not like social media where you can put up a facade and keep everyone at an arm's distance because you don't want them to see your brokenness and sin. But church is a community where we live in close proximity to one another and Paul expects that you'll know their home. Which again comes back to hospitality, doesn't it? Opening not just hearts, but homes. Look what he says then in verses 4 to 6. He says, He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for someone does not know how to manage his own household. How will he care for God's church? Again, the rationale is, is blatantly clear. If you can't manage your home, how can you manage the church? Now, I, I, I know we need to be careful here because no man is without sin or weakness in this area as a husband, uh, as a father, as a, as a person. But you can't shy away from the biblical norm that if I want a good idea how he will lead the church, I need to see how he leads the home. The scripture says that he must manage his household well. And he defines well. What would well look like? Well, his children would submit to him. They would submit to his leadership in a way which is, in fact, the scripture says, dignified. Because if, if a man 
if a man's children will not submit to his leadership, why would the church? If he cannot convince his children to follow him, what chance the church? That's Paul's rationale. The managing of the home is qualified with the word it is dignified. It's not a home which is chaotic or despotic. That is, it's not out of control where every man, woman or child does what they want, but it's not despotic either where he rules with an iron fist. That's not, that's not the submission that the Scripture is speaking about. It is dignified the way he rules his home. I once had an assistant when I was in Sydney um, who I had to ask for his resignation from ministry because at least in part he couldn't manage his home well. And it had become to the point where it had affected his ability to preach because people in the congregation were making so many comments and they were coming back to me that none of his girls obey him, none of his children submit to him. It's chaotic in the church as his kids run riot. Now, and I know, look, children are children and they're going to be noisy and they're going to be disobedient because they're fallen and sinful too, just like us. And all those things... We're not asking for perfection, but yet nonetheless, the Scripture says, look to the home and those who manage their home well are likely to be those who manage the church well. It's a judgment call. I understand that. And and I realize it can make people feel uncomfortable because we're all, as parents or as children, know our fragilities in these areas. And we know our failings. And often it makes us timid to press the issue but the Bible does, and therefore so should we. If he cannot manage his home with dignity, he cannot manage the church. It's actually a deal breaker. So we know what he desires. We know what's expected of him to be qualified, what it looks like for him to be above reproach. We know where it's tested. It's in the home. And then the last little section he throws in there is, an, an, is about his maturity and his reputation. Look at verse 6 and 7. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. In other words, one of the things you should know about that is, you notice twice, twofold reference to the devil. One is about pride, that if he gets, if he gets this calling to eldership and He becomes an elder when he's too immature that the devil might use that to puff him up. But also that he must have a good reputation amongst outsiders lest he fall into the snare or a trap of the devil. And and the very point of saying that, at least what you should say, the context is it's spiritual warfare. If, if, If Satan wants to take down the church, take down the leaders. If he wants to destroy a church, destroy the pastor's marriage or the elder's marriage or, or, or have elders who are angry and divisive, that'll destroy a church. Or have someone who's young and unqualified and is not mature and is puffed up with arrogance and that will destroy a church. And that's spiritual warfare. And he's warning, he's warning the church, be aware that Satan, he prowls like a lion even around the leadership. You need to be able to know and watch that man mature and grow. Now, it doesn't mean that he's perfect. We understand all that. But he must have shown a maturation, a growing. Can't just be a recent convert. Now, that's contextual because when Paul planted churches, he then went around towns and made elders. How long could they have been Christians? But, but in our situation, we don't have to rush into that. Therefore, it's a good warning. If they're immature, if they're recent convert, you don't elect them. And while character is different from reputation, character is who you truly are. Reputation is what people think you are. While character is more important than reputation, nonetheless, the, the Bible says, watch, look at his reputation. Make sure that he's got a good reputation with outsiders, that he doesn't bring the church into dis- disrepute. In other words, he needs to be well thought of. 
NJP we, we we're been here what 10, 12 years as pastor. We're at a tipping point again. We're going to come out of COVID one day. We're going to join back together sometime, hopefully soon. But what we need more than ever is good and godly and unified, qualified leadership. We hope one day, by God's grace, He's helped us plant one church. We want to plant more churches, not for our glory, because we love God, but we love our neighbour. I love Lara. I want to see a church planted in Lara. You might love other places of this great city of Geelong, but here's the thing. God has placed us here to worship him, and the way that we do that is by bearing witness to him. And if we're going to do that well, let me tell you, we need good and strong eldership. We need men who aspire to that noble task of being protectors of the covenant community to equip them for the work of ministry, because that's our work. Our work, every Christian called to bear witness to Jesus in their community. And the best way that we can do that is God has blessed us with elders. And he's given them a task which is clear. And so when you vote on eldership in the next two weeks, you let that be the context in which you vote. And the session has recommended uh, Ben, but you are free to vote for anyone you wish but in the session's estimation that he is qualified. He's got a very dodgy football club and that, that's not a deal breaker. That's like having no breaks. Actually, that's probably more like having no sense. But, but anyway, he's a Bulldogs fan. But we believe he's qualified. In about two to three years, we want to have more elders elected. And we're hoping to have another two or three men you need to be praying now for that. Praying that God would raise up men who don't wait till they're called to be an elder or made an elder, but start acting like an elder now. Start providing, protecting and feeding. Start managing their homes well with a godly character. Pray for that because if the session goes well, if the leadership goes well, it will go well with us. And we, we hope to have more elders so that at some point if we plant another church, we can split our session and some will go there and some will stay here. Pray for that, for qualified, godly men who love Jesus and who love his bride. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you bless your church with elders and with deacons to serve you. And we thank you for those two offices. And as we Think about electing deacons in the next few weeks and, and older. We pray you'll give us wisdom and unity. But most of all, we pray you'll bless us with people who are qualified for the office, who love you and who love your church. And we pray you will strengthen the infrastructure around our church that, that is shaped by your word. Because where we have strong leadership, there we'll have a strong congregation with a strong gospel focus, with a strong ministry of equipping and teaching and training the body of Jesus Christ for their work of ministry. To this end, we commend ourselves to you. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.